another episode of the 2021 Online Student Development Conference. I'm Mariette Holker, I'm Chair of SAS. With me today are two of my council members, Umpumi Maringa and Kalita Shadrach. And also joining us today are very special uh, guest lecture for today, Penina Karalida. And uh, before I steal any of Mpumi's thunder, Mpumi is going to do a full introduction to Benina. Over to you, Mpumi. Thank you so much, Mariette. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so, Ms. Penina Emmanuel Kadalida is a Tanzanian archaeologist who received her first and second degrees in archaeology from the University of Dar es Salaam. She is an assistant lecturer currently teaching archaeology and heritage uh, courses at, at Dar es Salaam College of Education, the DUCE, a constituent co uh, college of the University of Dar es Salaam. Her, prof her professional interests focus on human origins, concentrating on both skeletal remains and stone artifacts, as well as the environment and environments and aphrodisiac human e evolution. She is looking forward to pursue her PhD in the near future. Today, her presentation is titled Architects of Engaruka, Technocultural Complex, Testing the Sonjo Hypothesis. All right, Penina, you can take it away. Thank you so much for your good uh, introduction. My name is Penina Emanuel from the University of Dar es Salaam, as Mpumi said. And today I'm going to take you through uh, a title called Architects of Engaruka Technocultural Complex Testing the Sonjo Hypothesis. As you see the picture there, that is Engaruka, one of the pictures showing how the architectural uh, structures are. And Engaruka is an abandoned system of agricultural and residential ruins of Northern Tanzania, spreading to more than 2,000 hectares and stretched to nine kilometers on the base of the Great Rift Valley. It dates back to the late Iron Age, 15th to 18th centuries, and it is famous for its irrigation and cultivation system. If you look at those two maps, it is within the Monduli district. And you look at the big map of Tanzania, there's a portion there with Arusha. But again, in our right, after the Indian Ocean, you can see those different locations showing Engaruka and the nearby mountains. So it's just bordering uh, the Kenya in the northern part. But the other side of the map shows the, the real map of this, the, the northern part of the study area where you see some of the villages of which I did some of two, that is Sale, somewhere in between the Sale Plain and Serengeti and Digo Digo. Those are the, the areas where I collected my data from. And previous studies that had been done in this area of study, Engaruka, uh, yeah, they go back to 1883 where Dr. Uh, Gustav Fischer studied Engaruka and said, there were masses of stones that became suddenly apparent, rising from the plains of height up to 10 feet. But again, there was another scholar in 1896 who said Engaruka had its great stone cycles and dams. Another person came by Margaret Chola in 1901, who said in the mountains, there are numerous stone cycles and stone dams which are not connected to the present inhabitants. Again, we see the first excavation that was done in 19, 1913 by Hans Reck, who gave the first detailed description of Engaruka, and he called them cane fields. Leakey and his wife, Mary, having been given information by Hans Reck in, in 1914, estimated that in the Engaruka, there were seven villages, large villages containing roughly a thousand homes with a population of over 30,000 people. But it didn't end there. We see Charles Keller and his colleagues in the 1970s contacting a geological and stone research in the Lake Manyara in the Engaruka regions where they located MSA and LSA materials. But we see John Sutton beginning in 1970s. He is the first one who has studied Engaruka for many years and almost 
three decades researching in Garuka, he tried to establish the origins, development, and the collapse of Engaruka. But despite the intensity of his research, Saturn only managed to leave more possible answers than finite ones. But from 2002 to 2006, uh, we see professor from uh, the University of uh, York, Professor Sirinam. Is it York? I think I've mistaken. But his research is, uh, he conducted two types of research at Engaruka, where the first one uh, went by cultural ecology of East African savanna environment in a long term historical perspective with a focus to late iron age. And the th second one was long term ecology of the savanna environment, which concentrated on studying connections between Engaruka and the Sonjo area. And the recently, the real stamp combined interest is combining interest in agricultural history, applied archaeology in the later archaeology and ethnography in East Africa, entitled Archaeology of Resil Archaeology of Agriculture Resilience in East Africa. This is uh, a study that I think is still going on, and the real stamp. It, if it wasn't for the COVID-19, it could be again July, August. And then the, the, the project examines the sustainability of agricultural systems in Engaruka, Tanzania, and Konso in Ethiopia. Again, Konso in Ethiopia, they, still, they have the same irrigational system, systems, and that's why dump, st the real stamp is doing such a comparable studies. Again, we've seen different scholars trying to establish the makers of the ruins. Those are the Engaruka. For example, Jiga and Huile in 1904, he attributed the Engaruka ruins to a people called Idatoga. Sasson on the other side associated them to the Iraq, where the Iraq is a Kushaitic or a group within Afro-Asiatic people in Africa that reside in the Bulu highlands of Northern Tanzania. Again, we see uh, Nas and Lord Trant trying to link Engaruka and Sonjo, which is a small Bantu speaking community within some kilometers, almost 80 south of Lake Natron. Like the Iraq, the Sonjo are known for their use of irrigation systems, as well as terraced village sites, a practice that they do even today. While much has been done on Engaruka, none of the mentioned or even the ongoing studies, except mine, has dealt with the question of the architects of Engaruka conclusively <laughs> from the time of scientific researches noted of its existence. The site still has questions in this aspect, and many questions remain unanswered, including who were the key players of a such sophisticated farming system? Some researchers such as Gray and others, as you see there, have provided suggestion on who might have been the makers. That is perhaps they never had. And that's why I said my study is trying to, to, to test the Sonjo hypothesis among the hypothetical ethnic groups such as the Iraq, Tatoga, and Maasai. However, those researchers never provided any conclusive answer on their research works. And therefore, this paper presents the findings of the SAID study with a deep desire to settle the Sonjo riddle being the architect of the Ngaruka, both for the interest of science and for the Sonjo history. What methods did I use and what results were collected? I employed uh, four uh, types of methods to both Ngaruka and contemporary Sonjo, which are archaeological surveys that were done unsystematically. And the reason behind this is the Sonjo area has not archaeologically been done like in a big percent. But again, I did observation and that was participatory where I was, I, I can speak Sonjo, so there it wasn't a big deal when I was doing that. Again, I did oral interview and it was face to face and I chose a 50 number of people, 20, uh, male and 20 female, where I balanced the ages from youth 18 to, uh, to, to 30, and the other age were elders. But again, I did excavation where I established two trenches, one by one, and the other one was 1.5 meters wide. 
survey and observation results. These are now seen from Engaruka. From my right, you can see stone structures of the old Engaruka. You see the cycle, the cycle of the stones. Inside there is where they built, they built their houses with use of water and the grasses. But on the other side, you see irrigation systems that were used to in the agricultural systems of the old Engaruka, as you see, they are made by stones. But again, you can see terraced field, field, stone field divisions. Inside those fields that you see is where they planted their, their plants like sorghum and others. And in my right, you see a pottery that has been reconstructed with having vertical and horizontal uh, incisions. Those are all from Engaruka. And the, the right picture, I took it myself, while the other one is provided by Saturn in his writings. That is a, a firestone from a, a fireplace from Engaruka, where this was excavated in 1960s by different scholars who were actually trying to establish links between the Sonjo and Engaruka, and they came across that stone fire place. Now, observation and survey results from Sonjo. In comparison to what you saw from Engaruka, you see a present day living Sonjo. There's a house there and that belongs to the, the village leader where he lives now in Sale village. And on the other side, you see contemporary uh, irrigation and stone field divisions where they are planting the same, same plants that were revealed at Engaruka back in those days. Those are the sorghum. And some you can see by far distance, you see the different vegetations and some plants that were maybe used for as standings in the houses, but we also see bananas. We also see in my left fireplaces in Sonjo and the pottery technologies of the Sonjo. That is a reconstructed base of a pot shed that I excavated from Sonjo and it was the only one that was decorated with such incisions, both parallel, uh, parallel and no, horizontal and vertical incisions. Uh, now I'm going to take you through comparable evidences that could be seen between Sonjo and Agaruka, trying to provide you the linkage that I said, I'm trying to test the Sonjo hypothesis, whether they were the makers of Engaruka or not. In my left, you see, uh, the fireplace from Engaruka in comparison to the present one, this that is shown in Sonjo. So that, that is the first comparable evidences seen while trying to establish the linkage between the two. You can see the those two terraced fields from both sides, but the difference is at Sonjo, they're using soil while Engaruka, the fields are divided by use of stones. Reasons behind this is the soil at Sonjo is more compact and therefore water can pass without any problem. In comparison to Engaruka, it's the, so, the sand there is sandy and therefore it is carried very easily by water and therefore in, a, to, in order to keep the water passing, they had to use the stones versus soil. But you have to understand that in Sonjo, no, although they used soil, there are a lot of stones around the area, but they chose to use soil than versus the stones. So you can look at those two potteries having the same kinds of decoration patterns, vertical and uh, horizontal incisions. For the Sonjo, we see the base and part of the rim, no, and the part of the body, but here we see the rim, the body, and a section of the pot going down to the base. Those are all reconstructed. And again, we see some utilitarian objects. The arrows, these are all present from Sonjo, but the arrows were also discovered at Engaruka some years back during 1960s when people were excavating. And also there was a, a, a hole that was uh, revealed, retrieved when they were doing excavation. Therefore, these were found in Sonjo and writings have reported presence of arrows and uh, tanked holes. Discussion. Sonjo are said to be unsettled people, moving from one place to another. But these are not nomads, they're Bantus. Why were they moving? Because of different diseases and wars from their neighboring Maasai and other people 
who threatened their lives whenever they settled. Oral interview revealed different areas where the Sonjo may have lived before settling in the present uh, villages. We see Narosura, Kenya, where they established irrigation systems. They also lived in Taitataveta in Kenya. And the other place where they lived is in Grumani. I've also been there and I saw some terraced field, fields, but I'm not sure if they belong to the Sonjo or any other society. But in the future, we really need to establish whether they belong to the Sonjo or not. Pinyini again is a, a place in the Sonjo areas, but occupied by the Maasai in the present time. And they have irrigation systems that is trapped from Mount Olonyelengai. And the other place that they lived is in Garuka, where now we see the evidences coming from there, the stone structures, the fields and the fireplaces. At all these places, they establish irrigation systems similar to what they have, you have seen in the present area. They are known to be hunters and gatherers, but the culture is disappearing maybe before because of environmental changes and social cultural interactions, which are actually leading them to adapt domestication versus hunting and gathering. They are also cultivating, cultivating sorghum, finger millet, pigeon peas and sweet potatoes, while maize and beans supplemented after 1950s. So this saying, sorghum, this and finger millets, pigeon peas and sweet potatoes were the original kinds of food that they cultivated. Now, trying to see the linkage between those two again, there are songs that were sung about Engaruka by the Sonju people. And the songs are regretting living a very productive area with enough water, while other parts of the song mention about wars, and that has been seen by Rotland. When I was doing my research, they also sang me a song, and that is where you can see, and, but in, an, in, a, in, a, in a simple uh, elaboration is the song is trying to elaborate as like they left a very productive area that is in Garuka where they could go to eat and take ripened foods when they got there, but they were fought and chased away by their neighbor enemies. Another thing that is observed that provides linkages is the hillside sites where we see both Sonjo and the Garuka building their houses on the slopes. And when I asked the Sonjos why they do that, they said, we do this because of we need to, it is for safety, viewing enemies from a long distance. Now you can see those irrigation systems, a comparable. You've seen and I have explained them, the pharaohs from Engaruka and those of Sonjo. And I talked about the differences in the soils and use of stones. The stone structures of, of the same two uh, ethnic groups and Engaruka people as well as the Sonjo. You can also look at the fireplaces and these are built inside the residing areas or just some few kilometers or few meters outside the home. And the purpose of using this is for settling different uh, disputes within the society and the number of 10 to 8 elders sit there uh, in fire, with fire in between at the middle in order to talk and settle whatever happens. At Engaruka, we see Fosbrook and Sassoon's excavation of 1960s showing, saying there is a close connection between the Sonjo and Engaruka when it comes to the use of fireplaces. Pottery. The traditions, the Sonjo uh, pottery tradition is characterized by mica tempered. That is, uh, it is, uh, sometimes it is appeared on the surface, is smeared on the surface as decoration, but the temper that is used for making the clay before they manufacture the pots, they use mica. And this has been reported by different excavation from uh, Engaruka, and a good example is Sestonet. Sanun again also observed that this is a quote that he said, it is clear that Engaruka cannot be fitted into any known pattern of the earlier societies of East Africa. This is particular, particularly surprising in the view of very characteristics of pottery, which is found there. And it seems inevitable that 
Before long, this pottery will be recognized in other localities. Indeed, this has been shown by Engaruka, by the Sonjo excavation, where we see what was said to be inevitable. Some parts of the Sonjo are made with high straight necks, that is 10 centimeters in diameter, and they use this for brewing honey. And it has been reported that the same same pots were recovered from Engaruka and Sassoon and other scholars that uh, discovered those, they suggested that they were used for brewing honey as it is seen in other ethnic groups. Conclusion. The study aimed at identifying the architects of Engaruka ruins by testing the Sonjo hypothesis, by through examining the Sonjo agrotechnological culture back to 18th century. It also compared the Sonjo agrotechnology with that of Engaruka. It identified other possible cultural linkages between the two cultures, especially expressed in pottery tradition, and identified the relationship and later drew a conclusion as to whether the Sonjo were the makers of Engaruka technocultural complex or not. Drewet 1999 argued that a settlement may be abandoned, leaving features, pits and buildings, as well as artifacts. Several factors such as natural or man-made may lead to the abandonment, leaving no time for residents to recover even the most valuable items. Other sites may be abandoned gradually, where inhabitants decide to take and what to be abandoned, depending on relative value and portability of the artifacts, as well as the distance. The distance here is seen as an essential element in deciding what item is to take and what to leave. For instance, when moving within a short distance, even bricks can be salvaged for reuse, while with long distances, heavy and easily replaceable items are more likely to be abandoned than light and scarcer artifacts. When a site has to be inhabited, other communities nearby the area may see it as a useful local resource for firewood and building material. The constructions can be scavenged for local use, resulting in partial or complete removal of wood, bricks, or any other reusable material. On the other hand, when inhabitants move to a new area, regardless of the distance covered in the movement, ideas of their cultural lifestyles and technologies move with them. Therefore, Engaruka dwellers moved to new places such as Sonjoland, applying their traditional life ways at their new residences. However, with modifications as dictated by new environment, soil structure being one of them. There is a big contrast between the Sonjo and other hypothetical groups such as the Maasai, Tatoga, and Iraq. Although the Iraq, the next strong ethnic group to relate to Engaruka after the Sonjo, have irrigation agriculture, they do not build any stones and they have no fireplaces. And again, their home places are not built at those of Sonjo because they have rectangular houses, which are sometimes under the ground and on the surface. Furthermore, the hypothes hypothesizing the Maasai and Tatoga or any pastoral uh, ethnic groups should be omitted because Maasai as well as Tatoga or any other pastoral group do not possess a history of engaging in agriculture, forming permanent settlement or hunting wild animals. Also, they do not have a bow and arrow culture. And they use swords and spears as opposed to arrows for killing anim animals when it, if it happens. Also, Maasai have been living with wild animals at Engarupa and Gorongoro, but there have never been incidences of killing wild animals for reasons of food. Therefore, although different communities may have occupied Engaruka after its abandonment. It is reasonable to take the Sonjo as the architects of Engaruka technocultural complex on the basis of available evidence. But other evidences, including use where 
petrographic and DNA analysis is needed to make a meaningful conclusion. Those are my references. And thank you for listening and having me with you. Thank you so much, Anina. Um, it was a very enlightening uh, presentation that you posted. Um, I'd like to open your question and answer session. So I wanted to know if I can speak to this. So question four was, what is the significance of determining the architects of Ingaruka? Okay, under this question, the first is, we are going to settle the, the puzzle. Like, why everyone asking who made this, who made that? So I think after determining the architects of Engaruka, one of the significance is actually solving that riddle. And that's all. But why are we solving the riddle? Because it is for both for the scientific and for the history of the makers themselves. They will benefit from what has been actually brought out today by the research. So understanding who made that, it is a good kind of initiation to studying the cultures of that certain group with their technological advancements and maybe ask them why are not they not doing what they did in the past. So this is the one of the significance I think it's going to be carrying every other factor of having an archaeological site in a certain place. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mariette, do you have a question to ask? Um, uh, has any, and this relates to ceramics and, and, and the different uses of ceramics, you said um, that there was a inference that some of the ceramics were used to store either honey or beer. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know if there's any um, like trace analysis or lipid analysis currently being done on the ceramics? Yeah, I think uh, there is this, uh, the southern part of Tanzania, we have these kinds of pottery which are long, have very long uh, neck, and the body is not as big as the ones that we see for storing water. And those people in the southern part of Tanzania, they use those for, uh, for keeping honey. And the reason behind they use that, the long, because the honey is too heavy. And therefore, if they are pouring it down, they need to have something that is very long and sharp so that they can actually uh, pour it in a good way. To the Sonjo, they have this, and I've seen it practically, where those pots are used and they use, they take grasses so that they can sieve. The, the, the honey comes with those particles from the, what do we call it? The hives. So they use some grass particles so that they put on top of there and they sieve in order to get the clear honey. But again, these are the ones that are used. They have different types of measurements that they use when they are paying dowry, when a lady is getting married. So they are putting them in different sizes. If you say, oh, you know what? My, my girl needs thousands and thousands of this. So they say, this is the big mark. You have to go with that. So practically, yeah, other parts of uh, Tanzania, we have seen those. They've been found in Engaruka and people have suggested uh, they've been used using ethnoarchaeology, questioning the present day living Sonjo and others. And they br brought about a conclusion that if these pots were you are used for this and the Sonjo still use them for the same purpose, therefore at Engaruka, they were also used in the same way. Very interesting. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, Thank do you. We have, do we have any further questions? I think I, I think you had one. a question number five. Ah. Yeah. So I wanted to ask about has the site been dated? Sure. It has been dated, and it was dated by using carbon fourteen, where samples of charcoal were took were, were taken from. Uh, uh, near associated material when people are doing excavation, and that's what they use to date the site, carbon-14. Okay, did they come up with a date for the site? Yeah, there's, it's 14 to 15, 14 from 13th century uh, to 18th, in between there. Okay. Yeah, and, and the abandonment oh. happened in the 18th century when people never actually left the place and now they're living in other places. 
Okay. Um, and then my last question is, are there any other studies that are going on at the site besides yours? In the present time, I said the real storm. I said, if it wasn't for Corona, it usually come after every two years. So he's doing that, he's trying to, he's having this resilient kind of study uh, for, with Dengaruka and Konso in Ethiopia with the same characteristics, the settlement and irrigation systems. So is, that is what he's doing for the present time. Other than that, other than UTSM field schools, we don't see any other researches that are going on in there. But I hope in the future, I'm going to look at the, the other evidences those, so that I can actually come up with a bold conclusion that the Sonjo are the makers. And that's uh, through the use of DNA and petrographic in the potteries so that I can actually understand if I'm saying on the basis of stone structures, uh, pottery technologies and other materials that I've mentioned, what about the DNA? Does it actually comply with my other results? Then I think in the future that's going to be done. Although my interests are not in those. I just wrote this for my dissertation and I was very much interested because it came up in my class. I'm much interested in the human origins and I'm still working in some things about human origins. Right. But that doesn't keep me away from establishing the real makers of Engaruka. Is anthropology. Mm, true, definitely. All right. Wow, that was you. amazing. Yeah. Thank you. We might ask you for another presentation on everything you do again. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm working amazing. on uh, the Ashulian of the Northern Island. Yay! I think soon. <laughs> so um, if there's another chance, I'm going to talk about is a new site. So we, we are working with some of the students and the professor. I'm delighted to have the opportunity and talk to you about what we found. Wow, thank you awesome. so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hopefully we'll get the opportunity to meet you in person in uh, future conferences, you know, in a, in a post-pandemic yeah, the other, world. <laughs> the other one is going to be in Tanzania. Welcome so much. The EAPP, oh. Eastern African Paleoanthropology and Paleontology Project. I see Kalita nodding her head. I think it seems yeah, I like like she knows that. about that one. <laughs> that's a dream. That's amazing. Yeah, that's where we met with Impumi in 2019, oh, Nairobi. Yeah. Sure. Wow. Awesome. Well, thank you, Penina, so much for this presentation. And we'll definitely take you up on your offer to invite you for future lectures. Um, thank you so much. So to the students tuning in, remember to go and do that pop quiz that's associated with this presentation. Uh, so mm -hmm. we'd like to see your engagement with the with the content and keep your eye out for the remainder of the lectures in this series. And then once again, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Have a great day.